Welcome and thank you for joining us today for their conversation series on the impact of COVID-19 in Africa. Today we're going to be focusing on Nigeria. I'm Mary Kay Gugarty and I'm a faculty member at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance and also the principal investigator for the International Program on Public Health Leadership. I'm also an affiliate faculty with African Studies. Uh, today, I'm going to have a conversation with Oyele Dun Okunwamade, who is an alumna of our international program on public health leadership. Ladun is co-lead on the National Surveillance for COVID Response and head of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control's Rapid Response Surveillance Team in Nigeria. So she's going to be a terrific person for us to talk to. She's talking to us today from Lagos State, uh, the center of the virus in Nigeria where she has been for almost three months now since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Nigeria. To save on time, we're not going to go into long introductions, but you can find our biographies and the webpage that's hosting this series. Ladam, we're so glad to be able to speak with you today. and We really appreciate you taking the time to join us in the midst of everything that's happening um, in Nigeria. So thank you. And uh, I'll just launch in with a few questions I have for you. Welcome. Can you, uh, tell you, Mary, us, you for having me today? Um, can you start off by telling us a little bit about the progression of COVID-19 in Nigeria to date, what the situation is like where you are in, in Lagos State, and what things are are and are like in other areas of the country? Um, so COVID-19 um, started last year, December, and um, by January 30th, WHO declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international conference. Um, concern. And um, by January, the same period in Nigeria, we conducted a risk assessment of um, the COVID-19 experience in other countries. And we identified um, importation as a major risk of Nigeria getting this infection. That is, uh, travelers bringing in um, COVID-19 into the country. Uh, so based on the results of that risk assessment, uh, Nigeria activated a COVID-19 um, preparedness and response plan. This was activated across different pillars in the country. Um, it cut across coordination, um, surveillance, case management, laboratories, logistics, risk communications. And uh, using this avenue, we developed um, public health advisories, uh, which were developed and disseminated. This is to give the public information that they need to know about COVID-19 in terms of how to protect themselves, what they should look out for, and um, how to report and where to report to. And uh, based on the risk assessment also that we, uh, we looked at the risk of travelers coming into the country, we increased surveillance at all the points of entry, all the international borders. We posted a surveillance team there and um, to ensure that they screen all passengers especially those coming from high-risk countries. At that, point, at that period, we had uh, just about five countries on our list, China, Japan, and um, some other few countries. So we identified all the passengers coming into the country from these um, high-risk countries, and we screened them and followed them up for a period of 14 days. Um, so all these, um, we also build a diagnostic capacity and also strengthen our logistic process in, the, in this period. Um, so following this preparedness phase and um, increase in surveillance activities, um, on the 27th of February, Nigeria identified the first index case of COVID. Um, this was um, identified in a 44-year-old um, foreigner that arrived from Italy. Um, he arrived from Italy on the 24th, and, um, this COVID was diagnosed on the 27th of February, um, and um, that was the beginning of the outbreak. So immediately, the preparedness and response team that was already on ground, we just activated the emergency operation um, plan immediately, and it transited from the plan to EOC activity. And uh, so um, from there, on the 23rd of March, you know, we just had um, one case on the 24th, 24 and um, on by the 17th of March, 7th of March we had another case, then 17th of March another. So we're having um, a kind of a singular uh, reporting outbreak. But by the time within a week period on the 23rd of March, the outbreak has affected six states with 40 cases, and all these cases were with travel history. 
those that recently returned from countries of um, high transmission into Nigeria, and they were all diagnosed with um, COVID. So this prompted Nigeria to suspend all international flights into the country. Mm. And um, that was the period of our first lockdown. They announced the first lockdown and also closed all the international borders. And um, this has been on until 4th of May when Nigeria lifted um, um, the lockdown on, is, is the lockdown a little bit, not the total lifting. Um, so I would say as of today now, um, currently in Nigeria we have um, 6,401 confirmed cases and um, this has been reported in 34 states with 192 deaths, giving us about 3.2% of case fatality rates in Nigeria. And um, Lagos State has the highest of these confirmed cases. As, that, as it is today, Lagos State has 275 um, 2,755 uh, confirmed cases. This was closely followed with um, Kano and then SCT. So um, I can safely say that Lagos State is the epicenter of the health break currently with the highest uh, confirmed cases of about 41% uh, of the total cases recorded in Nigeria. And Lagos State has a mortality of um, 38 out of 192 recorded in the country. So, um, Currently in Lagos, where I am, I can say that at the initial phase of the outbreak, actually, the number of confirmed cases that we recorded had traveled history. But towards the mid, um, when it was getting to every week of 18, we started recording high proportion of cases without travel history, either with um, a contact with the confirmed case or no contact were traced at all. So at that point, we had um, another strategic meeting and we decided to change strategy. Mm -hmm. um, from the progression of, um, in terms of when it comes to surveillance, um, instead of focusing into just um, case investigation, we changed strategy into what we call an active case search. Going into the community to actively look for more cases. So we, we, we embarked on what we call the active case search house to house as well as um, health facilities. So at that point, instead of using generic case definition, we develop what we call the community-based definition. That's the case definition that you can relate with at the community level. And um, also, we focused more on contact tracing. Contact tracing is rapidly identifying those that have been in contact with the confirmed case or those that have had contact with those that had um, travel history and they were confirmed, and rapidly identify them and follow them up for the period of incubation period. This is to, um, to ensure that we rapidly identify more cases, confirm more, follow up, as well as ensure early isolation of all confirmed cases. This is all the um, strategy we're using in Lagos in, in, in combating this outbreak. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear how you pivoted from, from one strategy to the next once you realized you really needed to go into the communities and identify what was happening at the community level. And I also really appreciated what you said about finding a community definition for the disease, something that really resonated with the community. Um, I'd love to hear more about how, in general, people in Nigeria have responded, but also people in the communities when you went in and started with this um, community disease definition and contact tracing. How did people respond to the social restrictions and how are people responding now that those social restrictions um, are beginning to lift a little bit? What's been the community response? Oh, okay. So um, I will say that um, at the beginning of this outbreak, um, because of um, the peculiarity of the outbreak, um, the outbreak, you know, it started more um, among people with uh, travel history. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a initial preponderance of the outbreak in the urban community, urban area in the city. Uh, but by the time we started um, having community transmission, uh, where we decided to change strategy into using community case definition and finding more cases, we realized that um, some parts of the rural areas were affected, especially in Lagos State, both rural and um, urban centers. And this um, necessitated the lockdown um, that Nigeria actually instituted at the initial stage. 
But before then, um, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, who is the agency that I work with that leads on the response for COVID, actually in the country, I started a campaign uh, known as Take Responsibility. This was um, before the restriction, and then um, before the restriction was lifted and all that, before it was eased. Uh, this Take Responsibility campaign is to ensure that people get the correct message in terms of um, what to do, social distancing, you must go out, um, wearing of face masks to reduce the transmission, the importance of social distancing and to avoid um, um, public gathering. Um, so this was actually uh, started, this campaign actually started before the end of the social distancing. So it has given, before the end of the lockdown rather, so it has given the, the majority, the community, um, the information that they need to take decision on their own, to be responsible for their health. Uh, because, you know, when it comes to COVID, people need to take responsibility. People need to understand why they need to avoid social gathering, why they need to avoid uh, social distancing. And we made it known to them that it is actually for their own good and they should strictly obey this. So by the time um, the lockdown was eased, it was um, easy for people to keep up with that uh, responsibility because they've been informed and this information has given them the, 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 the knowledge and the power they need to take their informed decision. Uh, although we have um, some exceptions actually in terms of uh, people that will be not totally obliged because of the economic situation. People need to go out to, to sell, people need to go to the market and all that. And um, people need to avoid religious activities and then a lot of businesses need to close down uh, for this purpose. But it's a trade-off, a, a kind of a trade-off, economic implication or health implication. So we made them realize, NCDC has made them realize that at this period, um, staying alive, Staying healthy should be our main focus, and so far, people have been operating. That's wonderful. That's great to hear. Um, as you talk about your response and your ability to, to pivot and all the things that the CDC in Nigeria has been doing, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Nigeria's experience with previous disease outbreaks like Lassa fever or Ebola has helped prepare you? It sounds like you were really able to mobilize rapidly and change course when you needed to. So how did previous experiences prepare you for this particular pandemic? Ah, thank you for that question. You know, Nigeria is uh, a kind of a peculiar country in terms of our populations, and uh, we've had to deal with a lot of communicable diseases in the past, uh, ranging from uh, yellow fever, measles, Ebola, uh, meningitis, and uh, we still have polio with us. Nigeria is one of the countries that is yet to be certified. And also, um, having to deal with this outbreak has given Nigeria an opportunity to build capacity of the health system at different levels. And then um, we, we also conducted what we call a joint external evaluation of uh, international health regulations um, in 2017. Uh, this joint external evaluation is, um, is a WHO um, activity that allows each country to assess their capacity to prevent, to detect, and respond to any public health event. And uh, when this was conducted in 2017, we identified a lot of gaps in our um, health system. And um, immediately out of this, uh, we had a stakeholders meeting involving all the stakeholders in health system and um, security as well. Uh, the way we, we sat down and we look at those gaps as well as recommendations, and we develop what we call the National Action Plan for Health Security. Um, this was a kind of a, a, a working document, legalized document um, that um, all the health sectors, uh, all the agencies that are involved in responding um, during any epidemic were bound with to, to ensure that um, activities that we need to work on to ensure that we move the health system um, of the country forward. And um, uh, this cut across different technical areas and we use it as an opportunity to ensure that we build our capacity at different levels and strengthen the health sectors across, not just at national level, but across different levels and different sectors. 
And um, I would also say that part of our success story also, um, we it has also helped us in, build, in the, um, having an early preparedness and response plan. And um, this early preparedness and response plan is not only domesticated with NCDC, uh, it involved all the agencies and partners um, we supported the development of this preparedness plan at the national, and it was easy for us to translate this to the subnational and the local level. And um, also, uh, part of the success story as well, when this outbreak, um, when this outbreak started with the activation of our EOC, Nigeria also activated what we call the Presidential Task Force. Uh, this Presidential Task Force is, uh, was established at the highest level of government which is um, a multi-agency and multi-sectorial um, oversight, uh, has the oversight of the COVID response, and to ensure that the, this response get the attention at the highest level of governance. And um, uh, so far, I will say that our past experience has uh, demonstrated that involvement of um, community people, community leaders, air care providers at the community um, help to build trust and um, ensure that um, the coordination and um, is, is the coordination is well accepted at the local level and also um, the past outbreak that Nigeria has been able to respond to has helped us to invest in building capacity of the health worker and not just investing in people it has also helped us to invest and strengthen the logistic blockchain uh, logistic chain within the country and you know, during the outbreak, we need um, as a rural area, especially out to reach communities, you need to supply and deliver essential supplies and medication. So um, we've used um, the, the 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 experience of the previous outbreak to strengthen the system and has made um, access to this local area a lot simpler and um, for this process. And um, in terms of our capacity at the country level. Nigeria Center for Disease Control, we've trained rapid response team across the country. And um, also, there's a program called Nigeria Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Program, which has trained field epidemiology across the country. We, we have over 400 field epidemiologists that we call upon at any period of the outbreak. And um, they are the same, we, we use the same uh, during Ebola, and this is the same structure we're using currently. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I was going to ask you a little bit. We we met and um, when you attended our international public health leadership program, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about leadership um, in the midst of this crisis. But I think you've given us some great examples already about what quick, sustained, uh, you know, national and regional leadership can look like in helping to respond to the crisis. Is there any other? example of, of leadership that you feel sort of proud or happy about in terms of how um, you or other leaders have responded to this crisis? Um, I would say one thing that, um, that stood and um, one thing that Nigeria is standing out on in terms of this outbreak is that um, presidential tax force, the leadership, the coordination at the highest level of government. And, um, you know, at a crisis, any crisis like this, any country needs um, to be able to make a decision quickly and to be able to, to make a rapid and um, some uh, decision without having to wait for uh, a long period of approval. And at the same time, we need to ensure that enough resources are being mobilized. And um, I would say that this is um, a plus uh, for Nigeria, we've been able to establish um, uh, leadership at the highest level of government and um, this has helped Nigeria to take decision rapidly and urgently during these response activities. And um, every effective leadership actually is um, it's very important during any public health threat. And Nigeria has demonstrated that uh, during this period and I would say that is very, very commendable. When um, it was time to make a decision on a nationwide uh, lockdown, uh, suspension of international flights, closure of all international borders, uh, because this uh, PC here has been in existence, it was easy for them to make that decision without having to wait a longer period and um, 
exposing more and more Nigerians to um, um, this uh, um, outbreak. So that has been a very uh, commendable um, aspect of, of this outbreak. Yeah, and I think there's some interesting lessons for, for our country there as well. Like the United States, Nigeria is a federal system. And so having that national leadership um, really mm -hmm. matters to help help different regions coordinate. Um, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you as well about um, how how people like you who are working on the front line and the front line health workers are doing in Nigeria. It's a large mental and physical load on, on people that are working in public health in Nigeria. So how are how are workers coping and how is that part of the response going? <laughs> okay, so uh, that's a very interesting question and it's very, very important for, you know, a lot of people tend to overlook it. They believe we are health workers and then you should be able to cope in any um, condition and any situation. But I will tell you, um, it, is, it can be very, very challenging. Um, everybody on the lockdown with their families, with their homes, and you're there on the field outside, you can't see your family, and um, you can't even stay with them and deal with them. It takes a lot of the mental health. And uh, another thing is, again, is the issue of burnout. You're, you're on the field, 24 seven like me, uh, most times several nights I don't even get any sleep. We work all night, you have to get up early again to ensure that the outbreak is, um, you keep responding to the, uh, this outbreak and it doesn't get out of hand. So there is a lot of burnout, I, I'll tell you, I, I'll say, um, a lot of emotional exhaustion, you know. Sometimes you just wish things could be normal back and you just desire that you have those days back, you know. So a, a lot of physical exhaustion as well. And another thing is as a frontliners, you are at the face of um, the risk of getting infected all the time. So there is this fear of health workers infection. The current majority of the health workers are infected already. We have colleagues that have been to isolation um, center, some have been discharged and all that. And um, build up of all these can lead to depression or feeling of helplessness. As in, you can't run away, you can't run back, you have to face it every day. And um, health workers infection, this is availability of even the effective PPE uh, at all levels of the sector, especially even for those that are the private sector. Um, those are some of um, the challenges that we've had to face with and it takes a lot of tolls on our emotion. Uh, but I will tell you that um, for my organization, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, at the management level, they've established what we call the psychosocial support. And uh, so that is a very good step. Uh, we have a psychosocial um, helpline that you can call any time of the day, 24 seven, if you need somebody to talk to, uh, you need counseling, if you're overworked, you're tired, any form of um, psychosocial support that you may need. And this has really helped, um, helped us a lot in this outbreak. You have, um, you, can, you can get accurate update information from them. Uh, they give you quality time, they give you listening here. Sometimes, it's not just about them replying, but it's about somebody listening to you. Mm -hmm. And um, apart from that as well, I would say the leadership of um, my organization, my director general, uh, has shown, um, shown us appreciation different ways. And the value of this has gone a long way to actually boost morale of the people. You know, sometimes they're on the field, you will send you a message, if after a while hearing from you, it will give you a call, hope you're doing fine, hope you're well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you feel valuable, you know that, yes, you are not just forgotten on the field. Um, even the people at the level of leadership, they're looking after you, they're thinking about you, uh, they're caring about you, they're asking after um, your welfare. So that has gone a long way to, to, to really boost our morale. And um, also, the, the government and the community that we're working with in their own little way, so they show us appreciation. And um, that has been some of our coping kind of um, strategies. And individually, you know, we have a way of um, coping. 
like getting in touch with family. Even if you can't be with them physically, we put a call to them. Uh, for the past, I would say, for the past three months I've been here, I've had to rely on video calls with my, my children, with my family, and all that. And that has helped to stay calm on the field. And also, um, well, I won't say we have time. Personally, me, I don't have time for sufficient rest, but I can tell you that for other frontline uh, workers, having sufficient rest as much as possible also has helped. But uh, for someone in my role, I have to be awake because apart from the field work during the day, and they call it for the national surveillance, I have to collate all the national data across uh, the 36 states and the FCC in Nigeria and ensure that we update this information on our Twitter real time without making any mistakes. So that keeps me awake every night. And another thing I do in my capacity is to ensure that I track mortality across all the states in the country. So you can imagine, you do that all night, you get up again, you're on the field, and um, at the front line, um, pushing for the outbreak uh, to be over, responding, a lot of activities. And um, we've seen it as a way of life. But I can tell you, sometimes it can be very, very challenging. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You've given us a really wonderful sense of, of the challenges of, of, of doing this kind of work, both, both for yourself and the other frontline workers. But I think that's also given us really a note of, of hope and optimism that you've been able to support each other. And I think a great lesson about how much leadership matters in these kinds of crises, both policy leadership in terms of setting policies, but just your examples of, of your director reaching out, checking in on people, um, that those kinds of human interactions and, and really caring about people can go a long way um, in this kind of a situation. So we really wanna thank you for sharing your time with us, especially in the midst of all the work. I'm worried now it's the evening in Lagos and you're gonna have to go do all this work you just described to us. But it's really wonderful for us to have the opportunity both to learn from the example of Nigeria and to learn from you and to kind of hear what's happening in real time um, in Nigeria. So thank you, Laden, for, for taking the time and for sharing your experience with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, too, for the time. And thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my um, experience with the community. And also, um, it's even a good thing for us to know that as part of the fact that we're far apart, and um, we're in the midst of this outbreak. We still have our IPPHL community thinking about her, uh, giving us uh, moral support as well, and also checking up on us. And um, it, it goes a long way to say that we belong to a very good and very strong community. Thank you very much, Mary Kay. Thank you also, Ladun. And with that, we'll conclude our conversation for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and we wish you all the best this time. Thank you. Have a good evening.